You are listening to a sermon from Village Baptist Church in Petaluma. For more sermons like this one, please visit our website at villagebaptisthome.org. Our mission is to win people to Christ and develop them into active disciples. We pray this sermon is a blessing to you. Now let's hear today's message. Um, I am excited today to begin a new series with you. And the series is going to be in the life of Joseph. And uh, the title of the series is From Dreamer to Savior. From Dreamer to Savior. And this uh, story, it's not only one of the most uh, riveting and heartfelt and gut-wrenching stories full of so many wonderful and beautiful themes, love, forgiveness, Uh, hatred, good, evil, the sovereignty of God, the providence of God. It's one of the most beautiful stories, not just in Genesis, but in the whole Bible and all of literature, because this is actually a story that actually happened. It wasn't somebody who sat down to write a nice story. This actually happened. It happened to an individual. And so I'm really excited to jump into this uh, series with you. And in each message, what I want to do is look at the story of Joseph through three lenses. And these three lenses are how I will look at each one of the chapters um, chronicling his life. The first one is just simply what happens in the story. What happens in the story? Because this is a narrative, right? It's a narrative. It has a plot. It has plot twists. It has dialogue. It has heroes. It has villains. It has all these things that are part of it. And we just want to know what happens in the story. And so just to go through, and it's an ancient story, so there are things about it that we need to make sure that we're um, understanding from our perspective in our day and in our culture. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a fascinating story. But one of the things you need to be aware of, and this is true whenever you read the Bible, is that the Bible was not originally written to us. It has an original audience. And so the author is writing to someone in particular and is giving a message to them specifically. So what is it? The, the, the author, Moses, is writing to the Israelites, to let them know something specific. Something that happens in Genesis chapter 15, verses 13 and 14, as God is speaking to Abraham, he says, the Lord said to him, know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions." So this is a promise that God made to Abraham that one day your descendants are going to be in a land not their own. They're going to be slaves. And the question is, how did they get there? So these Israelites who are hearing Moses' uh, story, they're trying to figure out how did we get to Egypt? And that's what the story of Joseph is there to tell us. How did we get to Egypt and how did we become such a great nation? That's the first thing. So just the story. What is happening in the story? The second thing, the second lens we'll look at is how is Jesus foreshadowed in the story of Joseph? How do we see Jesus in the story of Joseph? The Bible tells one story. Even though there are many stories within the Bible, it is telling one story. And there, even though there are stories within the one story, it is telling one that God is going to send a savior and a deliverer into the world to save it. And so that's what God is doing. That is a story that he's telling. And Jesus is at the center of that story. He's the main character. Jesus, in the book of John, he says, You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. So you're looking at the Bible and you, you think in those you have eternal life. He says, if you really search them, they're actually talking about me. After he rises from the dead, a couple of disciples are walking on the road to Emmaus, and he appears to them, and he begins to have a conversation with them. And then this is what Luke says as he's speaking to them. And beginning with Moses and the, all the prophets, he explained to them that, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. 
So all the way back in Genesis, in Moses, Jesus says, this is how you can see me in this story. And so this is what we're going to look at. How do we see Jesus foreshadowed in the story of Joseph? And then lastly, what can we learn? If you start with what is the story and then how do we see Jesus, then what is it exactly that we learn? Paul, in Romans chapter 15, he says that the things that were written in the past were written to teach us so that through endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. So what is written in the Old Testament is written there to teach you and I a lesson to teach us things about life. The things that Joseph went through, the things that Joseph had to endure are going to be very similar to things we might have to endure. And what he learns, we can learn. So that's how we'll look at all the stories. So if you have your Bibles, I hope you do, meet me in Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37. And today I'm going to label the first message, Sibling Rivalry. Having siblings is amazing and annoying. If you have siblings, you know this to be the case. That if you have a brother or you have a sister, there are so many wonderful things about that. I have two younger siblings. And we had a wonderful childhood. Awesome, awesome childhood. But we also had a lot of fights. In fact, me and my younger brother, remember one time we were having this fight and it got so intense that we started throwing each other's clothes out the window into the garden in our backyard. So my mom, she comes out, what are you two dummies doing? And we're just throwing the clothes out of the, <clears throat> my dad had a garden in the backyard, so there's clothes all over the corn, all over the trees, all over the strawberries. And for what, I don't know what we're fighting about, but for us, it was, it was, it was about something And I told my kids this, and this is related. I told my kids, you guys live in a golden era because you don't realize what it was like to grow up and we only had one TV. (laughs) Only had one gaming system. My kids today, they got iPads. They got their own. They have their own profile. They can go on whatever app that they want to go on to. When I was growing up, we had to, here's the word, compromise. I said that to my kids. They were like, what? Compromise? Like, they didn't know what that even meant. And so for us, growing up, there was a lot of conflict around whatever things we had to share. But as much conflict and as much fighting as we did, there's one thing that me and my brother and younger sister never fought about, never had an issue with, and that was the love of our parents. We knew that our parents loved us. And that they treated us equally. They used the same belt (laughs) on all of us. All of us were treated equally. But the family we're going to see today is not the case. Look at me. Genesis chapter 37 and verse 1. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks of his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And he brought their father a bad report about them. Stop there for a moment. Here's, Here's the big idea that we're going to look at throughout this sermon. And that is that even though you can't see him or what he's doing, God is working. Even though you can't see him or what he's doing, God is working. So we meet Joseph. He's 17 and he's a shepherd. Now with this, um, walking into a story like this, chapter 37, is like walking into a TV series that is 37 episodes in. And there's 50 episodes in the entire series. If you walk in in the middle, it's like, what's happening? What's going on? What's all these names? So there's a little bit of history behind these first few verses that we read of here in um, Genesis chapter 37. So let me give you just a quick overview of what's happened so far. 
Abraham, who his name at that time was Abram, God comes to him and says, I'm going to make you into a great nation. The problem is, Abraham is old, his wife is old, and she is barren. And so because of that, God says to Abraham, I'm going to call you out of where you are. And when I call you out of where you are, I'm going to make you into this great nation. So he does that. And through some time, he births a son whose name is Isaac. And then Isaac has two sons. One is named Esau and one is named Jacob. Now, Esau was loved by his father, Isaac. He loved him more than his son, Jacob. But Jacob, he was favored by his mother. And so this created a sibling rivalry. This created an issue in the family. And Jacob, whose name means trickster, tricked his older brother twice. And the second time, the, the, the trick that he played on him got something from him that uh, was Esau's. Esau was so mad, he said, as soon as dad dies, I'm going to kill you. And Jacob was like, on that note, I'm going to leave. So he gets up and he goes to a far country. And as he's on his way, he runs into a girl. And this girl's name is Rachel. And she just happens to be the daughter of his uncle Laban. And so he is so infatuated, so he falls in love with her almost immediately. So he goes to his uncle and says, hey, can I marry Rachel? And he says, yeah, that's, that's fine. That's great. But here's the thing. You have to work for me for seven years. And then... I'll give her to you. So he's like, okay, and I hate long engagements, but that was a very, very long engagement. But the Bible says that he loved her so much that it only felt like a few days. So year six, he was like, it's coming, baby. <laughs> year five, it's close. It feels like nothing, baby. And then all of a sudden, it was the wedding day, the wedding night. There's a feast. And then there was the tent. And then Laban, Laban did something so deceitful. He switched Rachel for her older sister, Leah, who the Bible says had weak eyes. <laughs> we don't know what that term means, but we just know there's something going on. And he switches them. So that night, he doesn't realize, how Jacob did not realize it was not Rachel, I don't know. But he wakes up in the morning, and the Bible says, behold, it was Leah. So it's like the sun hits her face, and Jacob's like, ah. So he comes out of the tent. So he comes out of the tent, right? Comes out of the tent like, this is not what I ordered. And Laban's like, yeah, it's, it's, we can't let the younger get married before the older. We can't do that. So what I'll do, you stay with Leah, and then I'll give you Rachel. You just got to work for me another seven years. Jacob was like, okay. So a week went by, and then he was able to marry Rachel and then work for him for another seven years. And after a time, he left from Laban, took his wife Leah and his wife Rachel. Now, the interesting thing about Leah and Rachel is that even though Leah was one he didn't want, Leah was the most fertile. Right out the gate, she has four boys. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. <laughs> and Rachel, she's just sitting there like, it's not fair. It says she was jealous of her. In that day for a woman to not have children was like the worst thing. And so he, she says to Jacob, look, I have a maidservant here, here, Bilhah. You go be with her, and then you can have children with her, and then that will be the way I can raise and give you children. And Jacob was like, okay. <laughs> so he goes with Bilhah, has two more children. And of course, Leah's like, oh, no, 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 no. You're not going to do that. He's like, Jacob, here's my servant, Zilpah. Gives it to her. Two children by Zilpah. So Leah, she's got four. Then she has two by her maidservant. And so Rachel's sitting there like, what's going on? And then Leah has two more boys. So Rachel is feeling like this, this, is, this, is, this is not what I want. I want to have children. And then the Lord heard her cries and gave her Joseph. And then after that gave her another son, Benjamin. But tragically, Rachel died giving birth to Benjamin. 
And so this is the history behind this family. Very dysfunctional. As you can imagine what this household must have been like. So when we read that Joseph was out in the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, he brought their father a bad report about them. So what we learn right away, Joseph snitched. And you know what we say, snitches get stitches. This is just in our culture. If you tell, if you go to the police, if you rat us out, there are going to be consequences. This has led people to believe to say that Joseph was a spoiled brat, a, a snitch, and a horrible person. But I don't think that's true for reasons that we'll talk about uh, later. So look at verse 3. Now, Israel, Israel is Jacob. That's a, the new name that God gave to him. Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Did we read that right? Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons? We all instinctively know that's not something you do as a parent. Why does he love him more? Well, remember, Joseph is the first son of the wife that he loved the most. And he had Joseph at an old age. And when you get older, you just appreciate things more. Amen. Some of you have said amen. Yes, amen. <laughs> but he is, he is, in this moment, treating his son, Joseph, better than the other ones. He says he loved him more because of that. He showed it by giving her him this ornate robe. If you have older translations, you know it's his coat of many colors. We're not actually sure what this Hebrew word means. It could be translated ornate robe or long sleeve robe or richly ornamented robe. It's a kind of jacket or robe that would be long sleeved. It might even go down to your ankles. We're not sure exactly what it looked like, but if it did have color... In those days, to make a garment with color was very, very difficult. It's not like you just make a green or make purple. There was this whole process. Most stuff was white or brown or black. So if it was this multicolored coat, it would show you really love him. It would show his authority. It would show that he had a place above his brothers. And they get, he gave him this coat in front of them. And it says when they saw that their father loved him, notice, they saw. This was not for, they were not saying I'm speculating that my dad loves him more than us. They saw it. They knew it. In fact, this is not the first time. Earlier, when Esau was chasing after Jacob, they got to a place where he was basically cornered, and so he was going to surrender. And so Jacob put his family and his belongings all in order of importance. And first, he puts all the maidservants, then he puts Leah and, his, and her children, and then Rachel, and then Joseph. Can you imagine being one of the other sons just looking back and saying, I know where I stand with my father. If a bear is chasing us, I know who he will trip first. Because he loves these children, this child, more than he loves the other one. This is a terrible, terrible verse. That he loved them more. And because of that, it said the brothers, they hated him. And they could not even speak a kind word to him. Can you imagine living in a house like that? Well, your brothers, as soon, as soon as you come in the house, they don't say anything nice to you, and they hate you. They hated him. Can it get worse? Yes. You know, hatred, the fruit of hatred, it grows on the tree of favoritism. Wherever you find favoritism, you will find hatred growing. And it can get worse. Look at verse 5. Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. So they only hate him because of this, this favoritism. And now you got this coat. Now he has his dream. Listen to the dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright. While your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? 
Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Can you imagine? (laughs) You already hate your brother. And now he says, guys, I had a dream (laughs) that you're going to bow to me. Now, in those days, the way that they viewed dreams, for us, dreams are things that we don't always take all that seriously. We say, ah, you just had some McDonald's, and that's why you're dreaming like that. For them, (laughs) dreams were the way that God would reveal his divine plan to people. And so they took dreams very, very seriously. So the fact that he's telling this dream to them, they took it very, very seriously. So could it get any worse? Yes. Verse 9. Then he had another dream. And he told it to his brothers. Now, if, if Joseph had a friend, <laughs> just somebody who just say, hey, bro. <laughs> Don't, don't, don't tell this to your, to, your, to your family. Just keep it to yourself. But he says, listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time, the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. You don't need an interpreter to figure out what he's saying. Sun, moon, 11 stars. He has 11 brothers. Sun and moon. Who do you think he's talking about there? Look what he says in verse 10. When he told his father, as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. He has this dream first that these sheaves all gather around and bow down to him. And now he has a dream that the 11 stars and the sun and the moon, and they know you're saying that me, I'm your father and your mother, we're going to bow down before you and all your brothers. This is crazy. In this ancient society, men, especially the fathers, were the leaders. They were the elders. The older would never bow or stand in the presence of the younger. This is why it sounded so crazy. A father would never stand when his children came in. The children always stood when the father came in. The only time this was different was if the son became a rabbi. And in that culture, the rabbi was given that respect. So if someone's son became a rabbi, the father might stand. But Joseph said, there is no way that my father, how in the world would my father bow before me? The brothers are thinking, how will we bow before Joseph? This makes no sense sense. Just a side note on our way as we go through the story. Notice he said, will you and your mother, which is interesting because his mother, Rachel, had died. So then who is he talking about? He's talking about Leah. Leah, even though she's not his biological mother, he still calls her (coughs) his mother, which goes to say that just because you don't give birth to someone biologically doesn't mean you can't be a mother to them. And so this has gotten very, very bad, obviously. His brothers are upset. His dad is upset at him, but with one small caveat. Did you see what he says? But his father kept the matter in mind. His father said, hmm, I wonder if there's something going on here. I wonder if God is really saying something. So he just kind of kept it in the back of his mind. The story continues, verse 12. Now his brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, as you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I'm going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to him, go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks and bring word back to me. Then he sent him off from the valley of Hebron. So geographically, Hebron is about 50 miles away from Shechem. So to get to Shechem from where they are was 50 miles north. So this is a long trek for a 17-year-old boy to go and see what's going on with his brothers. So he said to him, let's see, verse 14, 
He said, go to him, go <clears throat> and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks and bring word back to me. Then he sent him off in the valley of Hebron. When Joseph arrived at Shechem, a man found him wandering around in the fields and asked him, what are you looking for? He replied, I'm looking for my brothers. Can you tell me where they are grazing their flocks? They have moved on from here, the man answered. I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in a distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. So he goes to Shechem. They're not there. He runs into a guy and says, yeah, I heard them say that they're going down to Dothan. So he goes down, and now he's on his way there. He probably has on, for sure he has on his coat. And from far away, they go, oh, here comes that dreamer. In the Hebrew, it's the master of dream, the lord of the dreams. They are sarcastically mocking him. And in, in this day, again, they don't have binoculars. So in the amount of space it would have taken them to realize it was him, they made a plan to kill him that quickly. They're like 500 yards away. And you, within that time, you're like, we're going to kill him. Now, how much hatred do you have to have for somebody to that to happen? So they said, here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him. And throw him into one of these cisterns and say, a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we will see <clears throat> what comes of his dreams. So they plan to murder him. Verse 21, when Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into this cistern here in the wilderness. But don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and to take him back to his father. Reuben is the oldest. And he had a plan. I'm not going to, let's say, throw him in there and then I'll take him out and take him back to his father. But don't think Reuben is doing this out of the goodness of his heart. Reuben is not really in the good graces of his father because in earlier chapters, he went and slept with his father's wife. So he's like, I got to get back on dad's good side. So if I save Joseph, and you know Joseph's going to tell. They threw me in the cistern. They tried to kill me, but only Reuben saved me. And his dad would be like, oh, my son Reuben. So this is his plan that he's coming up with. Throw him in there, and then I'll rescue him. So verse 22. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. This is a very violent scene. The word here for stripped is the same word you'd use when you skin an animal. It's the same word you use of dead bodies after they've been killed in war when you would strip the linen or the robes off of the bodies. It's the same word used as when you go through a city and you raid it and you strip the town of all of its belongings. This was a very violent encounter where they rip this coat off of him and throw him into a cistern. This is their brother. This is someone that is their flesh and blood. This is a very, very sad scene. Verse 25, as they sat down to eat their meal. This is the most cold-blooded verse. You've just thrown your younger brother into a cistern where he will die of starvation or of heat exhaustion, and you sit down to eat a meal. You've just thrown your brother in there, and you're passing around Chick-fil-A. <laughs> you got the nuggets? Yeah, what kind of sauce you want? Give me that Polynesian and like the Chick-fil-A sauce. And they're just eating as, as their brother's in a pit. How cold-hearted do you have to be? They sat down to eat their meal. They looked up and saw... They keep seeing. They saw Joseph. They saw their father loved. Now they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? 
Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. So he's like, guys, he's our flesh and blood. Let's not kill him. Let's sell him, which is so much better. Either way, he's probably being condemned to death. His brothers agreed. So when the Midian... Midianite merchants came by. His brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. That, those two words bothered me. Sold him. Your brothers sold you. The resentment and the anger you must, he must have had. Verse 29. When Reuben returned to the cistern, and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, the boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? See, I. He's more concerned about himself. Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in blood. They took the ornate robe back to their father and said, we found this. Examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. (laughs) What devious men. (laughs) He recognized it and he said, it is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will continue to mourn until I join my son in the grave. So his father wept for him. How sad is this scene? It's interesting to me, kind of ironic. I don't want to say Jacob is getting what he deserves, but he, there is a little bit of irony here because Jacob, he deceived his father by using goat skin, and now his sons are now deceiving him using goat's blood. But can you imagine the sons as they get around their father and they're comforting him? Oh, dad, we don't know what God is doing. We don't know why God allowed this but he's going to be working it out for your good, Dad. We would like us to pray. I, I can imagine they actually pray for him. Can you imagine? And yet you are the very reason why he is in the situation that he's in. This is a tragic story. But the, the author says, meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. That's a story. How do we see Jesus foreshadowed in this story? Number one, like Joseph, Jesus was greatly loved by his father. In the New Testament, when Jesus is being baptized, a voice from heaven said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And in Matthew 17, on the Mount of Transfiguration, while he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Like Joseph, Jesus was greatly loved by his father. Number two, like Joseph, Jesus gave revelation about the future. Joseph said these things were going to happen in the future. And Jesus, as he's on trial before the religious leaders, they said, hey, tell us, are you the Messiah? Are you the Messiah or not? And he says in Mark chapter 14, I am, said Jesus, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Number three, like Joseph's father, Jacob, pondered these things that he heard. Jesus' mother pondered what she heard and saw in Jesus. There's one story where Jesus gets lost. He's actually at the temple talking with the religious leaders. They don't know where he is, and so they come looking for him, and they say, Jesus, what were you doing? What? And he said, don't, why are you looking for me? Don't you know I had to be in my father's house? And they listen to what he 
He says, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. In the same way that Jacob treasured or pondered these things in his heart. Number four, like Joseph, Jesus was hated and had his life threatened. There's too many scriptures to show you this, but I'll give you two. John chapter 7, Jesus went around in Galilee. He did not want to go about in Judea because the Jewish leaders were there looking for a way to kill him. Matthew 12, but the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Number five, like Joseph, Jesus was betrayed for pieces of silver. Remember Judas, he comes and he betrays Jesus in Matthew chapter 26. One of the 12, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and asked, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. Then, from then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Someone close to you betrays you and sells you for silver. And interesting, who was the one who came up with the plan to sell Joseph? Is Judah. The Greek version of the Hebrew name Judah is Judas. Number six, like Joseph, Jesus was stripped of his robes. When we said that Joseph was stripped of all of his robes, in Matthew 27, they stripped him, that is Jesus, and put a scarlet robe on him. Then they twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. Number seven, like Joseph, Jesus was thrown into the pit. This word, the Hebrew word that's translated cistern, also is pit. It could sometimes be um, as a prison or sometime as a grave. You'll see this as we're going throughout the story. And Joseph was thrown into a pit, and in the same way, Jesus crucified on the cross and then thrown into a tomb. Then, number eight, like Joseph, who was pulled out of the pit alive, Jesus came out of the grave alive, showing his power over death. I think the Spirit of God wants us to see Joseph as being flawless. Even though we know he's not perfect, we know he is a sinner, but the way he is presented throughout the story, and not just this chapter, but as we go through the story, you'll see over and over and over again, you'll see that Joseph has such character, and I think what Moses wants us to see is that he is almost virtually flawless in the way that Jesus is flawless without sin. He wants us to see that Joseph is a mirror of Christ, which is when it talks about the bad report that he brought. Some commentators will say he brought a report that was a lie. I don't think so because that's not Joseph's character to lie. He is a good son who wants to please his father. So if they're doing something that's wrong, he's going to come and bring the correct report. And so I believe Jesus would speak the truth. Even when we talked about the dreams, he say, why would you, if you know your brothers hate you, if you know this is going to get you in trouble, why would you speak this out? And Jesus was the kind of person, I don't care what is going to happen to me as, as a result of speaking the truth. If it's true, I'm going to say it. Amen. This is what a preacher should do. I don't care if you like it or not, I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. I'm going to tell you the truth. And this is what Joseph said. Even if this might get me in trouble, this is the truth. And Jesus said, even though this might get me killed, this is the truth. And so Joseph is a picture, again, of our Lord. And I think Jesus actually is the true fulfillment of Joseph's dreams. Remember, ultimately what's going to happen is Joseph is going to be exalted. He is going to come and he's going to fix the issue in Egypt with the famine that's going on. And people are going to come to him and say, we need bread. And they're going to come to Joseph and get bread. But in the future, Jesus will come and say, I am the bread of life. And those who will come to me will not die. They will have everlasting life. You come to this bread and it will give you eternal life. It's a different kind of There are a day coming when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Amen. The brothers said, hey, we ain't bow before you. And there are people today say, I'll never bow before Jesus. One day they will. 
Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What Joseph said eventually becomes a reality and what Jesus proclaimed one day will become a reality as every tribe, nation, and tongue bows before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And his brothers, remember they thought if we throw him in the pit, if we kill him, then what will become of his dreams? They thought by that by throwing him in the pit, they could kill his dreams. But the, the opposite is true. They didn't know that by doing that, they actually propelled the plan of God forward. Just like they thought, if we kill Jesus, he can't be all that he's claiming to be. But they didn't realize that God had them in the script. So what lessons can we learn? What lessons can we learn? Again, here's the the big idea that we've been trying to hammer out that even though you can't see him or what he's doing, God is working in various ways. And we see, but here's, here's one lesson. Number one, ensuring a peaceful home is a father's responsibility. Ensuring a peaceful home is a father's responsibility. Jacob's actions are directly responsible for the strife and the issues in the family, particularly his favoritism. And if you study Jacob's life, you'll realize there were times where stuff happened and he did nothing. Stuff happened with his daughter. Stuff happened with his sons. He didn't do anything. And fathers have the responsibility of leading the home and leading in a way where the family can have Peace. In fact, this is one of the things it says if you want to be an elder in God's church. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 4 and 5 says, He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? So Jacob had not done all he should have done as a father, And so I just want to encourage you and us, because I'm a dad too, in this task, that that God wants us to lead our families in such a way that there is peace in our home, but not perfection. What's shocking to me is when you read the Bible is how jacked up families in the Bible are. Adam and his family. Isaac and his family. Jacob and his family. Read about Aaron and his sons, their priests. God kills them. Eli, Samuel, David. These are the people that we look at. Ooh, I want to be just like David, a man after God's own heart. His children are killing each other. And all, I mean, it's an absolute madness. And so, you as a father, you are responsible to lead your family. And so, sometimes what happens in our children's lives is a direct result of the way that we have parented. So we need to own that and we need to have responsibility and ask the Lord to help us. But here's the, sec- the, the, the other side of this is that you can parent perfectly and your children can still not love the Lord and go their own way. So it really, it, 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 children have a, I have three, they have a mind of their own. And no matter what you tell them, how you raise them up, it's not a guarantee. The, the book of Proverbs says, raise, uh, train a child in the way they should go. And when they get older, they won't depart from it. Proverbs are not promises. They are principles. So most of the time when you do that, they will, they will turn out just great. But there are times when you can do everything right, and the son or daughter does not stick with whatever you taught them. But it is our responsibility to do that because Jacob's actions are directly responsible for the trauma in Joseph's life. And the other thing is that fathering doesn't end when your children turn 18. All of his kids are over 18, except for Joseph, and at some point he gets older. But just because you're a, your children are older doesn't mean you still have, don't have a responsibility to father them. Because I still call my dad for stuff and my mom for stuff. doesn't end. Here's the next lesson. You must deal with hate, envy, and jealousy in your heart before it destroys you and the people around you. If you don't deal with the hatred, envy, and jealousy, it can balloon into something much worse. Heart issues don't remain there too long. They become hand issues. If you're not careful, what's in the heart makes its way to the hand. 
And this family has a history of this. Cain and Abel. He was envious, hated his brother, killed him. Jacob and his brothers, they hated, they were jealous, and they sold him. Then you look at uh, Saul and David. Saul was so jealous of David that what did he try to do? Try and kill him. This is what happens when you do not deal with the hatred in your heart. Listen to 1 John 3, 15. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has <coughs> eternal life residing in him. I read that verse much differently now because there have been, over the last few months, things that have happened in my life that have made me think, oh, I see exactly why the Lord says you need to deal with hate in your heart. Because the things that can come to your mind as a result of the hate and the envy and the jealousy and the anger that is festering in your heart is very scary. And you think, oh, I'm a Christian. I'm saved. I have the Holy Spirit living in me. Let somebody do something. Let something happen in your life and you'll realize how much we need the grace of God. Amen. Sometimes Christianity, we, we talk real cute, like love your enemies until you have to do it. Yeah. <laughs> we can be churchy for a while. And eventually we get into the real world like, ah, you know what? <laughs> the blood is still covering all my sins, so I'll just continue. I said the fruit of hatred, it grows on the tree of favoritism, but in that fruit lies the seed of murder. My wife, she watches murder stuff all the time, <laughs> which concerns me a little bit. Um, <laughs> but in all these shows that she's watching, the thing that I keep seeing over and over and over is the reason why people end up murdering someone that they know is because of envy or jealousy or anger, or hatred. And it's people that are close to them. It's festered for a long time. And so I, I want to just encourage you, please deal with it. <laughs> Next lesson. <laughs> Two more lessons, we're done. Uh, number three, coincidence is God working in disguise. Coincidence is God working in disguise. You know, the events of our life sometimes cause us to question God. Why did that happen? Why did you allow that to happen? God, why aren't you working in my life? But there's nothing in your life that's a coincidence. I want to share with you this definition of providence. It's a great definition. It's this. God, in some invisible and inscrutable way, inscrutable means impossible or hard to understand, inscrutable way, governs all creatures and actions and circumstances through the normal and ordinary course of human life without the intervention of the miraculous. So what this definition is saying is that sometimes we're, we think God is only working when there is fire coming from the sky and bread falling from heaven and miracles happening. But this saying that what God does is he works in this way that's really hard to understand, where he works just through normal human actions and no, the normal course of life. In other words, God just works in the ordinary. And in this particular um, story, there are so many things that you think that, how did that just happen to happen? Remember, Moses is trying to say, this is how the children of Israel got to Egypt. So his point, I got to get Israel into Egypt. How is he going to do that? Now, how did it happen? Jacob just happens to send his son to his uh, brothers to check on them. And then when he goes to check on them, they're not there. And he just happens to run into a man, just as a man who just happened to have heard his brothers say, we're going down to Dothan. Just happened to happen. In fact, it's such a weird coincidence, it led people to believe maybe this man was God or an angel. But it just happens to happen. And then when they get there, they sit down to eat their meal, and they just happen to be coming a caravan going down to Egypt. And they just happened to go to Dothan, which happened to be on a major trade route. And it just happened that Reuben wasn't there when they sold Joseph. If you look back, you say, is that just coincidence? Or is it the invisible hand of God moving in 
the free actions of these individuals to bring about his will. So this is the point I'm going to say. There are no coincidences in your life. There are no divine encounters in this story. We've been seeing angels, God appearing, miracle signs, and all of a sudden in the book of, or in the story of Joseph, in this period, there is no, there's none of that. And I think this period of Genesis, it looks a lot just like our day. It's normal. And you know, we, we think, well, we don't see more miracles. We don't see, God is working in the ordinary and the normal times of our lives. So where you work, who you sit next to on the bus, the barista at Starbucks, the person that you chat with, these are not coincidences. God has put these people in your life on purpose. When I go to Starbucks, sometimes there's a lady I'll come into the drive-thru, and she'll say, hey, green tea with two splendors? Remember, this is, the, this, is, this is not the window. This is like the part where you see all the, what you need to order, so she can see me. And she knows my order. And I feel like, I'm always like, sometimes I'm not even getting that. And she's like, green tea with two splendors? I'm like, yeah, just because, you know, I, I, I feel special. Like, she knows my order. <laughs> But in my mind, like, that is not a coincidence, that she's taken this interest in me and that she knows my order. So I've I've tried to use that as an opportunity because I don't think that is just happenstance. Then lastly, God works all things together for our ultimate benefit. Mm -hmm. This story actually is the Old Testament version of what we just read this morning in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. One of the ways we misunderstand this is we think that when it says that, that means that everything that happens to us is good. No. The stuff that happens to us is bad. It's not good. It was not good that Jacob favored uh, Joseph. It is not good that his brothers hated him. It is not good that their brothers threw him in a pit and sold him. It is not good that they deceived their father. None of that is good. And yet God used it for good. They meant it for evil. But God intended it or meant it for good. So absolutely, there are things that happen in our life that we say, why is this happening? One of the big questions they ask of Christians ask this question, why do bad things happen to God's people? And the answer is God is ultimately working things out for our good, even the difficult things. You think Joseph said, well, this is great. God's working all things for my good as he's in the pit. As we see as the story goes on, the other situations it's into. No, but God uses those situations. It's like someone who goes into a tattoo shop with the image of their unfaithful spouse on their arm. And they tell the tattoo artist, hey, I can't have this on my arm anymore. And then that tattoo artist takes that image and changes it into something that is beautiful. And God does the same things. He takes the things in our lives, even though they are not good in of themselves, and he makes those things beautiful. So even though you can't see him or what he's doing, God is working. Let's pray. Thank you for listening. If you would love to hear more sermons like this one or find out more about our church, please visit us at villagebaptisthome.org. Until next time, take care and God bless.